this is the 40th birthday of Amstrad computers. Strictly speaking, it was yesterday, but then it was in the UK, so you know, with the time zones and stuff. But, you know. but uh, also, I didn't want to do it on a Friday, I thought it was a Saturday, it was you know, better chance for them to come in. And uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll start with a, a little thing about uh, so, this is the Australian Computer Museum Society here. We are essentially uh, a club, I guess is what you call it. So, uh, in order to be here, you need to be a member. If you bought a ticket, then you're a temporary member. Just uh, for our liability and that sort of thing, because we, we're not completely open to the public. Uh, the museum is a registered charity, so we take donations. Um, everything that you see here has been either donated on loan or paid for by members. Uh, we don't get any government funding. We don't get a lot of funding at all, really. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you sort of have a look around, I think that we're doing pretty well. You know, I kind of like to say, like, some, you know, some museums do get $300 million to do renovations, you know, and we've kind of built this out of junk in a cave, <laughs> as, the, as the man says, you know. But, I mean, to be fair, like a cave would probably be warmer, but, um, <laughs> you, you know, this is really like something that has been built just with love out of all of the people that come here, and, uh, you know, we really enjoy what we do, and uh, we want to share it with as many people as we can. Um, I've got a personal connection to Amstrad, just in that it was the computer we got when I was a kid, you know, and uh, I kept it for quite a long time, because after my parents split up, you know, we didn't have as much money, and so I just sort of had to keep it going. And then it got to the point by about 1990, when you couldn't really find games in the major shops anymore. And so then there was a magazine called Amstrad Action that was out in the UK, and they would always have a little tape in the front. The tape would have like, games, demos, you know, utilities, and stuff like that. So every month I'd get the tape, you know, and stick it in, and then it'd be like, you know, like a, a little uh, new thing, because there was no internet, so you didn't download stuff like that. Amstrad Computers, uh, 984 up to 2024, and we hope maybe another 40 years. <laughs> so, going back to, I think it was the late 1970s, the Z80 CPU came out. And this was a big deal for people making microcomputers. It was uh, a development, really, of, uh, of Intel's 8080 processor. It was better in some ways, but the main thing is it was a lot cheaper, like a lot cheaper, and so suddenly instead of being something that businesses would buy to stick, you know, in an office, you could get one of these little chips and put it in all sorts of stuff, and, you know, Mark can probably tell us a bit later about, like, some of the ridiculous things you can do with Z80s with <laughs> very minimal electronics, you know, there was, I mean, the original Tech 1, it didn't even have a clock, it was just like a, no, a, a transistor. No, it had an oscillator, yeah, yeah so I've even seen the you know, like, um, it was literally like you just rigged up a button to the clock pin and you could press the button and each time you press it, it does one clock cycle. You know, so it's, it's um, I call it the AK-47 of CPUs because it's just sort of, it's so durable, it's just lasted for so long and I mean, they're probably going to stop manufacturing it but I'm sure that there's probably somewhere in Kazakhstan that they're still pressing it out of sheet metal, you know. And, <laughs> It's the kind of thing that when your enemy's got, you know, aircraft carriers and stuff like that, you can show up with a bunch of Z80s and still keep them busy, you know, so, um, and you can see things like Sinclair Z ZX80 was uh, one of the popular machines, you know, and then going under the spectrum, of which we've got a few back there, uh, the Osborne, there were all sorts of different machines that used this, so that's the kind of, you know, environment in which we're going, and uh, into a... Uh, um, Alan Michael Sugar, now Lord Sugar, uh, and the name Amstrad is just his initials, AMS Trading becomes Amstrad. So this uh, bloke here, he's, I think in the UK, he's still going around, uh, he was presenting the apprentice. Um, I mean, as a Lord, I think that he has some political office, so I don't know if you quite call him the Trump of England, but he's... Uh, He's, he's only ever been married to one woman, so we don't know, at least that's <laughs> yeah. true, but yeah, he's, uh, you know, he, his whole deal was that he wanted to make uh, electronics that were accessible, so not just in terms of price, but also in terms of use, 
So you can see here where he's got things like you know, the tower high five. So he would have a unit where instead of having to buy six different things and plug them together, you would buy a tower, you've got a record player on top, a tape player in the middle, and an amplifier, and they're already all pre-wired inside. And he was looking at the computers at the time, which was like you had to plug it into your TV, you had to have a separate power supply, you had to have all of these different things, have a tape player that you were plugging in. And he said, well, we already make tape players, we already make up TVs, why don't we just chuck it all in one little box? And thus was born the Amstrad CPC, Color Personal Computer. Um, and he brought in a consulting company run by a chap named Roland Perry, who you're going to see later on. And Roland was uh, kind of the lead there. I think that when he came in, they hadn't even settled on the CPU. They were looking at a few different ones. They were looking at 6502. And then they said, no, use the Z80. So that's what I got with that. But you can see the Amstrad sort of philosophy there. Of the power supply is in the monitor. The cassette player is in the computer, the keyboards in the computer. You just plug uh, video and power from the monitor into the computer, turn it on, and it's all up and running. But the speaker is inside it, so there's um, no speakers that can be plugged in. Uh, yeah, so this is CPC. The 464 name, I'm not entirely sure. There was one room that I've heard is that um, supposedly Commodore was um, going to call the, the successor to the six, uh, Commodore 64, the 264 with presumably a 364 to come out, and that Amstrad wanted to trump them by saying 464. I don't know if that's true or not, but anyway, 464 came out, sold quite well. They then said, well, to be serious, we've got to have a copy drive. And uh, for whatever reason, there's a, a few stories going around about, um, I think the Roland's official line is that the three inch disc was because the three and a half inch disc had not officially been released at that time, and the, the three inch was already being uh, pushed as a successive and five and a quarter inch disc. It was, I think, compatible, you know, in terms of its formatting and everything with the older five and a quarter inch disc. So he said it was the most IBM compatible disc at the time. Uh, the other story is just that Apache offered them some really, really cheap drives and they took them. You know, who, who can say? <laughs> but yeah, so when um, this disc, so then they've got the 664 which was you know, 64K of RAM and floppy drive and a very MSX looking design there with the kind of boss uh, cursor keys. And then very shortly after we see the by the 6128, which is 128K of RAM. Um, otherwise, though, there's really no difference between those three models. They all have the same graphics sound. They've got the AY sound chip, which uh, has been used in a fair few other machines as well. Uh, 6128 is the one which I had. The one over there is not my original one. That off eBay last year, so that's actually from the UK. Mm. But yeah, I had a lot of fun with that 6128. You know, I learned to program on it, learned a lot of things. Um, I built my own tape adapter by basically just stripping the wires off the headphones, plugging them down <laughs> in the socket because I put it in the mini plug. <laughs> so there was a lot of uh, they, good memories with that. They added some extra commands in the basic 1.1 that, to true, make yeah, graphics but this a bit easier. You did have extra commands because otherwise yeah. you wouldn't have been able to no, they like, didn't, like, they didn't have folders, but they did have user areas. So yeah, yeah. you CPM can actually stuff, yeah. tell the drive switch users and you'll see a second um, mm. a file system. But So it wasn't strictly a folder, but you could yeah. split the, the, the disks were 180k per side, mm. and you actually had to take them out, flip them over, and put them back mm. in and get the other side there. So uh, I don't know how many folders you really want to put on the disk level. Yeah, like uh, this was the 6128. There were a lot of uh, magazines and things, you know, in the pre internet days. These are three which I used to read. So we've got um, the Amstrad User, which was the Australian one, but Amstrad Action, which is the one that had the tapes on it. Uh, this one, CPC Attack, I only ran for six issues, but I really liked it because it had all these uh, neat little cut ins and stuff. They had a really good artist, I think, working for them. So they had this uh, character. Amy Stradivarius, or Am Strad, I guess, <laughs> who would show up on you know pretty much every game review, like kicking or shooting the character out of the game. So you know there were a lot of like these, these cute little cutters, and it had some some other interesting stuff. It had a demo scene coder who 
uh, told her to write machine code for scrolls and things like that, which I could never figure out as a kid. I've gone back to it now mm. and actually gone through those old tutorials. Um, yeah, so that's some of the stuff that we used to kind of have with that. So, uh, CPC is doing well. The next thing I'm trying to decide to do is called the PCW, which was uh, built as a dedicated word processor, so you do have one over there. Hmm. And the idea with this is that initially that it would only run a word processing program, but then um, I think that they decided that because it already had the ZA, it already had, you know, it's got more RAM than the CPC, it has some basic graphics capability, so they um, put CPM operating system on it, which was kind of a precursor to DOS, and made it into a more general purpose computer, which is why you can now play Batman on that one as well. Uh, it doesn't have a sound chip, it's just got a very simple beeper in there, which is why Batman's beeps sound so bad, but um, the graphics are actually at about double the resolution of the CPC, so you'll see some of the rooms in Batman um, are Kind of, it will show two or three rooms at once compared to what you'd see on the spectrum of the abstract uh, of the CPC. And that was another Z80 machine. And the Z80 also found its way into the NC100. Uh, we've got one over there still in its little satchel, so we can do that out and look at that later on. And I think there was an NC200 and possibly some other ones after that, which may have gone on to be incredible, I'm not sure. <coughs> so, next up. So Sinclair has not been uh, completely idle in this time. They uh, upgraded the Spectrum to 128K. As well as getting more RAM, it's also got an AY sound chip, so it now has the same sound capabilities as the CPC. So if you ever hear any of the 128K games go on, then you'll um, notice it sounds a lot like CPC games. Still the same graphics, but we need to get into that. <laughs> um, but at the same time, Clive Sinclair, I think, had his finger in a lot of pies. Uh, he was determined to revolutionise motor transport mm -hmm. with the Sinclair C5, was it called? Mm -hmm. Which was a very odd-looking kind of... Uh, what you, like a three-wheel, yeah. yeah. recumbent oh. bike car type thing. It looked like something that... I don't it's pretty spacey-looking. Yeah, but it, it's, it's, it sort of looks like something that you'd expect a kid to make in a you know billy cart contest, though, doesn't it? You know? not, not very practical for yeah. the English weather, though. No. And so, <laughs> you know, um, yeah, with, with all of his resources going into that, he's taking the decision to sell off Sinclair computers. So Amstrad has then bought that. And depending on which side of the fence you come from, either they've saved the spectrum by turning it into a CPC junior, or they've ruined the spectrum by turning it into a CPC junior. <laughs> But you can see, so the Spectrum Plus 2 is uh, very much in the Amstrad vein, the same tape drive on the side there. Spectrum Plus 3, again, the 3 inch disk drive on the side there. Uh, they cut down the keyboards, I think, so they're a little bit smaller than their CPC equivalents, but you can see that you know, it's definitely got the Amstrad kind of touch there. Now, why would they want to have a CPC Junior? It's going to know cannibalise their sales. Well, at the same time, they decided to move the CPC up market a bit with CPC Plus. And this has been then spun off into the GX4000, which was actually a game console. Um, neither of these were sold, but we do have a couple of pluses around, uh, which I guess the guys are probably bought themselves. And these would use, uh, in addition to the regular uh, either tapes or discs because they were taking discs for the discs as well. They could also use cartridges. So on a cartridge, you had I think up to 512k long. Really? Yeah. So they could have a lot bigger uh, games, and the cartridges could also go into the console, there, which was cartridge only. Um, I can't imagine the console sold very well. It sounds like they were eventually floating up about 20 pounds or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where it's hands deep now. It looks yeah. nice though. I think it actually is <laughs> a good design. You know? like, yeah. It just I, came I out too late. It's something really bizarre that yeah. but apparently the mold for that was reused for something like a CAT scan yeah. device or something, wasn't it? <laughs> so, yeah, like, I think it is a nice design, but yeah. Came out too late. A lot of things though. Commodore mm. tried it a lot of times. You know, they, they consoleized the Commodore 64, they consoleized the Amiga think, twice. You know, the first one on CD TV and then CD. 32. You know, Apple tried to do console 
like it's very hard to consoleize a computer because it's like either you're going to maintain the compatibility, in which case why won't people just play their old games on the computer, or you're going to break compatibility, in which case then why are people going to buy that as compared to a CD or Nintendo? So, mm. uh, but yeah, the, the plus was out there. Um, so the, the other thing with these is that they had some extra graphics and sound chips in them, so you could have uh, a second graphics layer on top of the regular 16 colours, which would have, uh, I think, hardware sprites and also a bigger colour count. And yeah, there was a nicer sound chip in there, which could have more channels of sound. The extra capabilities were supposed to be locked under the cartridge games, but I think that people did eventually find out that could send certain commands to the CRT controller and then that would unlock it. So there were a few tech games that could then use the, the CPC Plus extra colour set. But the fact is that you know, 8 bits was kind of on the way out by then. This was, you can see from the design, this was really intending to compete with the Amiga, but it just, they didn't have the budget, I think, to go to 16 bit. But what they did instead was they started selling PCs. So you had things like the PC 1, 5, 1, 2, I think was the first one that they had. And uh, I'm not sure where we've got that, but it's around the room somewhere. <laughs> and yeah, then we've got things like the PC, which was a portable PC over there. And this has one of the worst screens I've ever seen. <laughs> if you really, really squint and you've got good lighting, you, you can read a few letters on there. So um, good, good keyboard though something. for a for a port good keyboard for a portable. Shame about the, the screen. Keyboard is really <laughs> I, I think Amstrad has always done good keyboards. Like mm. even now, you can pull out any of these computers you know, and start typing on it, and it really feels good. You know, like I mean, I've had to replace the keyboard membrane in that Spectrum over there. You know, the, the Auric I've had open about four times trying to get the keyboard to work, <laughs> but still got some dead keys. But yeah, Amstrad keyboards I absolutely love. And yeah, I think that really the culmination of the PC efforts was probably the Mega PC, mm. which um, it was a collaboration with Sega, and it's you can see there that it's got a Mega Drive cartridge slot, and essentially it was a PC and a Mega Drive in the same box, but not really talking to each other. So mm -hmm. you could either play Mega Drive games, and the output everything would go to the screen, or you could flick it over and boot the PC. So yeah, okay, both were running at the same time. So they were always both running. Yeah. But there was no cross-talk, was there? You couldn't run a program on the PC that would use the, the PC actually you uh, the admin card in the PC yeah. and the Mega Drive shared some uh, shared some actual things. So oh, okay. there are a few ways of actually well, making communicating with the If, if we yeah. ever see one of those here, we'll definitely <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I tried my one, yeah. <laughs> I grew up with one. So oh, yeah. oh well. So you just need one. I have one. I grew up with one. No, no, no. <laughs> no that's it. <laughs> I think the PC side of it. But it was great because you, while you were installing games on yeah. the hard drive, like you were it's installing X Wing, you just click over and have a game or something. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, okay, I like that. And so now we come up to the modern era, and you know, through people as mad as myself, there are still a lot of enthusiasts that are making things, doing things with these. Um, you'll see out in the front room there, we've got. The Fanzine GX. This is uh, one that's been published by a guy in Melbourne who sent us. This is not even first run, these are like pre production one. So we've got uh, one sitting on the table there that you can sort of flip through. And he's going to be doing a Kickstarter later to actually print these in, in bulk and send them out. Uh, we've got some of these devices. The Uli back is what's on my CPC 6.8 over there, which is why it's got a USB uh, port in the front there. And you can see things like uh, you can actually hook up Bluetooth and Wi Fi to it with some add ons. It's got a serial port, it's got a uh, 512K RAM add on, which is good because uh, the upper RAM uh, bank in my computer is Cactus. So, what I have to do is actually switch this to 464 mode. So, it thinks it's a 64K computer. And then it pages in its own memory to replace the bad <laughs> chips that I've got there. So um, if I ever get around to it, I'll try and place some chips. <laughs> you know, yeah, so this has been quite good. Then we've got things like this is the Dandinator DES, which uh, I've not actually seen one in the flesh, but this is an interesting sort of thing where um, 
it plugs into your expansion port, and then it has little cartridges, which are like a Game Boy cartridge. Is that a Dandon over there, Mike? No, it's a, it's a DDI-5. Ah, yeah, so that's another one. To another one. Another one. Control. Yeah, mm. so there, there are a lot of these add-ons now, because, you know, obviously, the discs and tapes are getting hard to find or breaking down, so we're getting these things where you can start to put, you know, and there's, there's uh, I think I've seen something which will let you run plus cartridges on a regular CPC. But it cannot obviously use the extra capabilities. Mm. So I think that something like, say, burning rubber, I think that you'll see the title screen, but without the words on it or some crazy thing like that. <laughs> so there's a lot of oddities. And what's next? You know, that's kind of, that's going to be up to us. So we start with this. Um, we're, we're already running the blade. <laughs> but um, yes, yeah, so the world model was the editor of Amstrad Action during um, about maybe 1992, maybe 92, 93 which was the period that I was reading it. And uh, yeah, I had quite a fun time talking to him, he's a really nice guy. It's 1991, mum and dad are fighting again. Do kids school don't like me, but I don't really care about them. Because when I get home, I'll switch on my CPC. Put in the latest cover tape, and then I'm finally free. For some Amstrad action, the Amstrad's main attraction. 16 colors, stereo, press play, then any key, let's go. Amstrad action, the leader of the 8-bit faction, the CPC attack. Always kept me coming back. Get Dexter Arkanoid, Grise or Cybernoid, Head over heels and Turrican too. Zapped to balls, BAT, Total Eclipse and Dizzy, Roland in time and Chase HQ. US Gold, Cold Masters, Ocean Software, Houston, Burning Robo was okay, what else do I have to say? Amstrad action, it's a growing 8-bit faction, the CPC attack. Look out world, the Amstrad's coming back. Hello everyone. Um, today we've got Rod Lawton here, who uh, many of you will remember as the long-serving editor of Amstrad Action Magazine. And uh, Rod, do you want to just uh, say hello and perhaps uh, tell us a bit about yourself? Yes. Hello. Hello everyone. It's, uh, it's quite an honor to be invited to talk about uh, the Amstrad days. Um, it's a while ago now, so I just hope I can remember all the stuff you want to know about. But thanks for the invite anyway. Yeah. My first question would be like, what were you doing before Amstrad Action? How did you kind of get in into that? Right. Well, how long have you got? Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, what, I started out wanting to be a photographer. I found out that it was easier to take photographs if you wrote about photographs. So I discovered more of a talent for journalism. But then getting into journalism wasn't that easy. So I started out in a production role, right. which is how I eventually got the job on Amstrad Action from my production background. Okay. That's great. And since the magazine, what have you been doing? Um, I, I know you're involved a lot with photography. That seems to be your main kind of thing now. Yeah, I am now. So, so after after Amstrad Action, I was briefly books editor at Future Publishing in the UK, um, and then I went freelance, just doing general tech, computing, journalism, that kind of thing. But then, when when digital cameras arrived about two thousand, that that gave me an an excuse to go full circle back to what I was actually interested in, which was photography. So since then, I've been a kind of full time photography journalist and that is uh, going back to the magazine like did you sort of i mean did you seek that out or was it just that you were kind of i want to work on magazines and that happened to be something that came up like did that find you or did you find it so i, I guess yeah i always wanted to be on magazines um at the time the, the world weren't really an opportunities to be on photographic magazines um it was more computing was really big back then especially magazines about computing um, so I did a lot of production work on a couple of those titles and getting the job on Amstrad action, <coughs> excuse me, was a kind of, um, 
it's kind of a logical career progression, you might say. But it 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 was kind of not quite what I expected, and I did enjoy it a lot more than I thought I would. Yeah, it's interesting, interesting times. Yeah, and I I mean I guess that my impression of it was from being you know like a kid really that that was reading it, and uh, so it always seemed like. It was very kind of lighthearted and funny, and I had this, I, you know, impression of this really like anarchic sort of workplace <laughs> doing pranks. And stuff. I mean, was it actually like that, or was that sort of stuff that you? Kind of no, it it, it actually was. I think I think yeah. we're all quite lucky. We were on the tail end of something. We were on ta- the tail end of a publishing era where, <clears throat> excuse me, where the the editorial staff had a lot more say over what the magazine should be and how it was run, because. The publishers didn't really understand it. So, you know, you hire geeks to do this stuff and just just make sure it makes some money. So we had a, a bit more freedom than I think magazine editors have today. I say a bit more, a lot more. Mm. So I th- I think I think my feeling was, and I think I think it's throughout the team really that that if we were bored, the readers would be bored. So that was always on our minds that you know, you, you you can't separate yourself from the reader. You can't think of readers being as like a commodity that you mine. You 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 have to think they're like you. And if something is boring or exciting to you, there's a pretty good chance it's going to be boring or exciting to your readers. So that that that's how we felt about it, really. Yeah, and uh, I guess something that um sticks in my mind is a lot of like those covers that you had with the funny sort of photos on them and you know there was points when one of the guys was smashing a tv for smash tv and you know things like yeah. that did did you just do that in the office or was there like a studio or something did you have like a budget for funny covers or how did that work yeah those those were the days when when magazines had the sort of budget where you could hire a photographer in a studio for a day to do the cover uh so that's what we did and often the B two or three of us down at the studio. It's a lot of time to take out of work, really. You probably couldn't do it today. But back then, you know, we always find a way to do the cover because that was the most important part. Yeah. Um, so we did <clears throat> we did kind of brainstorm ideas, <clears throat> excuse me, ideas for the cover. Mm. And then we we just we just went along to the studio. We told the photographer what we were thinking. And over the course of a few hours we figured out how to do it. So yeah, we we did quite a few covers that we were quite pleased with. I don't know, they say. <laughs> yeah, they were always great. And uh, did you did you feel like that? I remember there was um, I read a, an article fairly recently. It was Adam Peters, one of the guys that you worked with there, and he, he reckoned that there was a cover where he, he appeared um, shirtless as a punk rocker or something, and he said that the magazine actually sold four thousand fewer copies that month. <laughs> and that he was banned from appearing on the cover after. So, but I mean, yeah, do you that think could, that, that covers kind of did affect your sales? You know, if if you had a nice photo as opposed to just putting like the the poster of a game on it or something, it's it's very hard. It's very hard to say. It's very difficult to separate the separate out the variables to see what yeah. did it. I mean, um, the easier answer is to if you get get a good cover, then you'll get good sales. But in practice, magazine sales are seasonal. The the cover lines make a difference. What you've got in the issue makes a difference. Yeah. It it's a little difficult to unravel the cause and effect. Mm -hmm. So I think I think a a boring cover certainly won't help. But um I think I think you can go too far trying to analyze it really. I think one of our favorite ones, I don't know whether you remember the Will Hay cover. That's one we didn't shoot obviously. That was an education special. And um, our art editor, Rolly, found this brilliant stock photo of Will Hay, or black and white photo. And that's still one of our favorite covers. Let, let's so, what, we, did, we didn't the photograph them all. The looking character, is that what you mean? The schoolmaster, yeah. Okay, I think I think I do remember that, yeah. So I, I, I'm saying the name like everyone would know. So Will Hay was a black and white comedy film style of the 1930s. So yeah. back back in the eighties, we did 90s, get a lot of take... yeah. We, we did get a lot of British TV in Australia, but it was all right. You know, a bit later, it was probably like like the the goodies and the young ones and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very very high rotation in Australia, but yeah, that was probably <laughs> okay. Early no, it's just when those 
I, you like classic old fashioned comedy film that's probably mm. more remembered in Amstrad action days than it is today. So, yeah. yeah, I might do that a lot. I might reel off references that make so make no sense today. So stop me if I do. <laughs> no, no, the, bring it on. You know, like I, I always think whenever we have an event at the museum. I, I challenge myself to come up with a reference so obscure that nobody in the audience is going to get it because there, there are a lot of people that, you know, are deeper down every rabbit hole than I know. So no matter what yeah. I do, there's always going to be someone that gets it, you know. I can't believe it. I'm in a museum now. I can't believe it. <laughs> it's kind of, yeah. So, um, I mean, yeah, and, and I guess that's the thing. Like, like <clears throat> did you sort of imagine at the time that, you know, like I'm doing something for posterity or that, you know, this is going to be... Not not in the slightest, because at the time, I think Amstrad Action, like the other 8-bit titles at Future, because this was this is when the Atari ST and the Amiga were coming yeah. in, they got all the attention. Um, so the 8-bit titles were like were like a, a, a relic. They were still profitable. They weren't, they weren't like front-line computing magazines. And in a sense, not having that attention on them, gave the teams a bit more leeway and a bit more freedom because the publisher's attitude was, well, we don't understand why people are still buying these, but they are, so keep going. So yeah. that's what we did, really. No, I mean, certainly for me, a big thing was that you, know, you always had the tapes on the covers, you know, and, and <laughs> it, it had got to the point where, at least in Australia, where it was getting hard to to buy software for the Amstrad, you know, that they just... Yeah weren't really stocking it in many shops, you know, and I lived in a fairly small town. So it was only when I went to Sydney, say on the school holidays or something to go to one of the biggest stores there that you could actually buy games. But, you know, the, the local shops in my town would only sort of just have like, you know, maybe Sega, Nintendo and nothing else. So having every month, just like a tape with, you know, like even a, a small game or something on it, it was like, yeah. you know, a nice little gift every month, you know, just to, to put that in. So, if they loaded, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they, they always worked really well for me, and that's you know. Oh, okay, I, I found that like um, surprisingly, I mean, because now you know, being involved with a computing museum, you know, that I'm I'm sort of trying to re resurrect a lot of old computers, and I found that the 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 Amstrad stuff, the CPCs, are really fairly bulletproof. Like um, the disk drives go; they have a little rubber band, right? Yeah. But you replace that, but all the electronics are really quite durable i think like nothing seems to really fail on them too much um i know that with the, the commodores like we're, we're scared to plug them in because commodore power supply is notorious for um they, really? they do a thing where they kind of go um short circuit and just put high voltage straight into the the dc of the, the computer and just blow it up so but yeah i mean up you know i've, I've run a cpc off a usb thing you know and it just works fine like you know they're great yeah that's pretty impressive. I guess the other challenge is, I guess you have to use a, a really rubbish old TV as a monitor because yeah. that must be quite difficult finding monitors bad enough for these old 8-bit machines. Well, or with the right, or with the right inputs. Yeah, yeah. Look, it has been challenging, but that's been another thing that's been a, a, a personal project of mine is to like dig up every TV or monitor that, that has those kind of inputs because we've got you know the Amstrad as well as the Spectrum. We've got an Oric yeah. running around, and then even a lot of the old like speakers and things like that. They they all use the same kind of signals, and so yeah, to it's, the point where now I, I can kind of plug pretty much anything into a TV when I need to. So it, it was quite interesting as well at the time. You had these three main OB computers, and they were like different, um, different tribes, di different planets, even. So yeah. for an Amstrad user, the Spectrum. Spectrum computers and their users, they're, they're like the, the scruffy kids from down the street. We don't <laughs> yeah. we don't speak to them. Mm. And C64, that was just alien world because Future didn't have a Commodore Mag anyway. Yeah. Um so so they they would they were just weird outsiders we never spoke to or spoke yeah. about. So they, these these worlds were very, very brand specific mm. because I suppose at those times computers had very different, very specific operating systems, and you just yeah. didn't get a whole lot of crossover. Yeah, and I think, I mean, that's something that, yeah, I, I really find interesting about that period of, of computers compared to now. Yeah, it's like you said that um, I sort of compare it to like 
a couple of years ago, we were car shopping, you know, and my wife said to me, I don't want a French or Italian car, you know, at, but it's kind of funny that you can say that you can say like what a French car is, you know, and in the, yeah. I guess you could say what, you know, if, if you have like a computer from America or one from the UK or one from France or something that they're going to have these particular things about them, but you couldn't really now say, Oh, I've got a French computer, you know, like, <laughs> what would that mean? You know, if you if you yeah yeah did have that, you remember once once reading like a science fiction story about a parallel universe where Italy became the center of computing and Olivetti was, and they had these <laughs> absolutely beautiful computers, you know, that that were were kind of really you know nice to use because they were made by Italian artisans and that sort of thing. You know? And but the, it never happened, you know. That it's sort of the no, thing is Apple stole the idea become this kind of just this you know black rectangle and that they're so interchangeable well it's it's I interesting we, i think have we lost something there you know yeah i think in compute in computing as in sadly publishing everything has become homogenized mm. so in the early days nobody knew what's happening which direction they're going what the potential and possibilities were yeah. then as the whole whole thing matured you 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 get the accountants coming in, and 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 kind of rationalising and pruning, and carefully monetizing and analysing the whole setup. So it kind of takes away a lot of the invention and the strangeness and the wildness of those early days. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, and that's that's a great thing with the museum is that because it's a volunteer organization, you know, nobody's making any money, you know. So right. we sort of, you know, so I, I can indulge, you know, like I can say, I want to do an Amstrad day. And they say, well, as long as you organize it, you can do it, you know. <laughs> well, I think the thing is that the, the retro is back, isn't it? I think um, yeah. there's a growing sense amongst people, even if they can't easily articulate it, mm. that something is gone. Yeah. And making things better doesn't actually make them better. I know that doesn't sound like it makes any sense, but you think you're improving things. But yeah. in that process, you're also losing things. Sometimes mm. people want imperfection and unpredictability. They don't want sameness. Doesn't think. I think, um, I think there's a couple of things there. I think one of them is that I think these things go in waves. I think immediately after a trend, everyone mm. rejects it because yeah. that's how fashion works. But a little later on, People, people with a bit more distance can look back and say, oh, oh, I quite like that. That's quite cool. Oh, it's gone. So I think that's, that's kind of what's happening with um, computers. I think, with, I think the software has seen the biggest changes um, on those very limited 8-bit machines. Mm. The programmers had to use a great, great deal of ingenuity to make stuff work. Mm. And and that is often very apparent in the software. I think, hey, you know, how did they do that in in like uh 64k of RAM or whatever it was? So there was that. But also I think just as a lot of products have become homogenized, so I think gameplay has become homogenized. So I think the variety of gameplay back then was much, much broader. Uh obviously the the processing power was was pitiful, the graphics were mm. bad. And things like arcade conversions never worked very well. And you couldn't do a modern a uh, first person shooter yeah. in one of these old machines. Mm. But their limitations and because people didn't know what was what was coming, they could invent anything. Mm. Those two things, the limitations of the hardware and being at the start of something produced this huge variety of games and gameplay. I mean, I've still got my favorites that just don't exist, not not just the games themselves don't exist, but that style of game or that approach to game playing no longer exists. So that's a bit sad. Yeah. Do do you still play these old games? Like, do you? <laughs> I any... I. Well, I think when I left Amstrad Action, all the Amstrad stayed with stayed with the company, and yeah. I'm sad to say I've not I've not used an Amstrad since. Yeah. I've never had one of my own. They were all at work. Yeah. No, I I get that that yeah, like if something's your, your work thing, and then you you don't really keep it with <laughs> I, you. I, yeah. I suppose back back then I had I had a full time job, I had a young family, I had enough mm. to worry about. I didn't get to play computer games 
in yeah. my spare time. I can do it at work because it's my job. But mm. when I got home, there was always other stuff. So it kind of didn't happen, which is a bit sad, really. But but the thing is, back then, of course, you didn't have the internet. You didn't you didn't have online games. When once you left the place where your friends were, your mates were, you know, you're playing a game on your own. So not yeah. the same kind of experience, really. What were you kind of generally interested in computers back then? Like, was that something that? So I, I feel I, like you're you're now a techie person, like that you <laughs> up that sort of stuff as a result of that, or? I think I think I did. I I think it's a kind of journalistic mindset. It's a combination of being willing to research stuff and try it out and figure it out. But a large part of my career has been explaining that to other people. So I, I've, I've, my job is kind of being a translator for for regular people yeah. faced with complex or strange technologies. So I guess I guess that that is my interest as well. So although I didn't set out to be interested in computers, mm. it became interesting. Back at the t- in the day, like were you sort of aware of uh, like a, a a community in Australia, like that you know Amstrad was a thing here or I know we 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 weren't really. I think I think um, again, this is really pre internet, so you mm. you didn't have the same kind of global instinctive global communication and awareness that that we have now. Yeah, it's, it's a it's a very different time, and often it's easy to forget that that. People were relatively isolated. You know, a magazine yeah. was a way for them to be in a community. You only get it once a month, but you know, you you get to read about people like you. They send in letters, oh. uh, what have you. So, so that that was like uh, once a month paper based internet, if you like. So that's about the only uh, community we weren't really aware of an Amstrad community on, in Australia. But, we knew, yeah. you know, but, but that was the thing that's out there and. Yeah, it's just some of these these stories that you you find out about where these machines came from or what happened to them. You know, they're really amazing. Yeah, so I'd, yeah, I'd, I think uh, I think a lot of people are getting a bit bored with modernity and conformity, mm. and yeah. they're they're looking for excitement and interest outside of that. Mm. And I think the one thing that the internet and the digital age has done, it had in when everything was analog. It decayed, it disappeared, it vanished. With with today's digital media and digital life, it's brought old things back. It's brought old mm. films back. It's brought old music back. You know, before before digital downloads and streaming, your favorite bands of the seventies or eighties were lost to you forever because they might have been on some scratchy old single that went down yeah. the the charity shop or the the tip or whatever. But with digital. You can replicate these things. You don't get any generational loss. So you can replicate them and make them available forever. And it's kind of brought a lot of old stuff back. Yeah, I'm not sure whether that works with with old computers, but it sounds like maybe maybe there's a kind of resurgence of interest. Yeah, definitely. There, there are there are archives out there where you can find you know pretty much anything that was ever published on the CPC. So there there are people that are out there even now. You know, like just kind of scraping through you know, all of these forums and things and just see if anything pops up, then they go and, you know, make a copy of it. You know, there are people that are still reviewing, like on YouTube, reviewing new CPC games. And so it's, it's I think I think the restrictions of the hardware made programmers much more inventive. Yeah. Made them think outside the box with with the games they created. My my kids who are now are grown up now, they they told me I was a hipster. So I said, is that good? And they said uh, well, it just means you're you're obstinate and stubborn and don't go don't go along with everybody else. So I guess I'm a, I'm a hipster in that respect. So I, I am always fascinated by things which are were once popular and no longer are popular, mm. or older stuff that I think has, has become unpopular unfairly. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if you've ever played two games, uh, Tau Seti and Academy. How so, I do remember, yeah, yeah. I think the Academy was like a follow-up sequel, but yeah. um, so there's some quite good maths in there with the with the kind of well-constructed 
three-dimensional universe that is very, very big. But of course, the processing power wasn't there. So my mm. my memories of Tau Ceti are basically spending half an hour traveling through the infinite blackness of space, not seeing yeah. a single pixel. And suddenly six of them would clump together out of nowhere and attack me, and that'd be it. <laughs> yeah. Back at the start. So but it was a very complicated game, and I remember it was, yeah, yeah. Never, never being able to do anything in it except for just kind of fly around and get shot at. But you know, it was yeah, still, yeah, yeah. It was it was just exciting though to be able to be in a three D environment on a computer. You know, that was yeah. It's quite a grown up concept as well. In mm. in in many ways, a bit more a bit more grown up as a concept than a lot of modern games. Mm. Um. Okay, so. Just uh, run, running out of time on my Zoom here, so I okay. think we'll have to to start to wrap it up there. So, All right. Yeah. Look, I just I just want to say a big thanks to you for being being here. Um, it was really nice to talk to you. It was it was good fun, and uh, it's great to be invited. Thank you very much, and, yeah. and thanks for like asking said, the questions. I'm, yeah, I've got a lot of really fond memories of the magazine, you know, and I, I can remember, yeah. some, you know, sneaking it under my desk at school, you know, and just like <laughs> okay, that sort of stuff, you know, and it's like concentrate on your work. And but it's like, yeah. Now my work is, you know, computers. And, you know, I, I probably learned more from that magazine than I did from whatever like silly crap my teacher was talking about. <laughs> so, well, I don't know I can claim all the credit, but thank you very much anyway. <laughs> yeah. No, they, so were, they, were, they were good times. And it's nice to be asked these questions because it reminds me of things that you know have gone to the back of my mind. Yeah. So yeah, it's good to it's good to chat about those days. Okay. Yeah. So um, look, thank you very much. It's it's uh, you're welcome. Have you have been here? And um, yeah, I'm sure that everyone is is going to be very excited to see the video and to <laughs> hear from you. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll look. I'll, I'll take some photos or something from the day and, and send them to you yeah. so you can see what we got up to. That would be cool. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Okay. So um, thank you and, and have a great, I was going to say have a great night, but have a great day. It's, um, <laughs> yeah. it's, time for it's lunchtime for me now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, have a good lunch then. And um, thank you. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, hopefully okay. we'll see you again sometime. Yeah. Thanks for the invite. Yeah. yeah see you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Well done. <laughs> well, um, I'll tell you what, I, I told Rod that we would say hi to him. So, um, can I just get all of you guys to just do a big hi, Rod? Well done, Rod. Thank, Thank you. Thanks for the interview. Thank you. Okay, I'll send that to him. <laughs> um, so, I'll okay, guys, here we have uh, Brett Allen, aka the Clueless Engineer yeah. on YouTube, and he has a particularly Special, special interest, I guess you'd say. Kind of a niche I've fallen into. Yeah. Well, my, so, this is my hat from Estonia. So, um, yeah, it's kind of a niche I've fallen into. So, I haven't really prepared anything, but I've got lots of um, um, show and tell stuff. Show yeah, yeah, maybe you can just run to the podium. Oh, yeah, I've got a small YouTube channel. So one of the things I've kind of fallen into is, oh, yeah, that's it there, um, is uh, a lot of um, Soviet and post-Soviet computers. So uh, they cloned a lot of stuff. So the first ship they cloned was the AD80, which they called the KR580BM80A, which was obviously a very catchy title. <laughs> so they used to have a lot of machines. Um, then they cloned the Z80. So that was, they cloned that in the Soviet Union. They called it, uh, it was originally called the T-34, you know, after the tank. Uh, but then they gave it some other name. Um, and the other kind of Eastern Bloc countries like East Germany, I think and maybe Slovakia, or Czechoslovakia, they also made their own copies of the, of the Z-80. So what we saw basically, well, us, us old people, Maybe not the youngsters, uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union um, was in 1995. So basically, the Soviet Union uh, became basically a whole bunch of independent states, and also the, um, the Eastern Bloc kind of 
rock capitalism. Um, so that kind of was a pretty rough time, from my understanding. Um, and obviously, there's a lot of military factories that had to start making something. So there was kind of like this explosion of of computers from all these former Soviet countries and Eastern Bloc countries um, using these clones of the Z80. They're basically like Spectrum clones, so Soviet Speckies. You've got to be careful when you say that because technically they're not Soviet. But it's just easy to say Soviet perspective. So um, I do have a lot to, I've got lots of show and show I can do. So um, this here is a, a Slavotik, um, Video Igla, which is a computer game, or a video game. So this is a um, basically it's a Spectrum clone from um, Sevastopol in Crimea. Um, so Ukrainian. So the idea with this one, so they use, the interesting thing is they, they used a lot of DIN sockets. So they use DIN, so we've got a reset button. So we've got DIN for the, um, for the RGB, we've got RGB out. We've got Magneto phone, which is the cassette. Um, we've got uh, Britannia, which is um, power. So, you know, <laughs> sometimes, so this is like a seven pin DIN for uh, five volts. <laughs> you know, ground and, and five volts, but they've used a seven pin. Is, I guess that's whatever the factory was producing. They could get seven pin in, so that's what they used. Um, and then we've got um, yeah joystick on the end. So the idea with this one, so like I said, this is Ukrainian. Was that um, is that actually a keyboard? Sorry, you said that. Is that actually a keyboard? Yeah, it is. It's actually not a bad keyboard. It's, oh, really? it's, it's for, for a touch sensitive one. Uh, but I'll, I'll share this around. But the idea with this one is that it's actually got a ROM ROM expansion on, on the back, so it actually used cartridges. So I think. Um, so this one, is in Crimea, they have a lot of um, resorts on the Black Sea. So it was like a video game club for the kids. So they, you know, hooked this up to a black and white TV and they could play video games. So yeah, so that's, that's the, um, that's one of them. I'm going to pass it around. Um, what else have I got? Actually, the Ukrainians made a lot of machines. So this is, this is the Ikar, which is Ikar 64. Um, so Ikar is Icarus, or Ark. You know, we got that three two close to the sun, I yes. guess. So this is another so this is actually quite a good keyboard actually. It's it's quite um, responsive. So I don't know if I want to type hundreds of letters on it sort of thing, but um, yeah, so again we've got um, we've got DIN sockets for everything. Um, but yeah, so RGB out. So that's just another yeah, another spectrum spectrum clone. It seems solid. Those, yeah, those ones are. So uh, compared to some, was <laughs> with us. All right. Um, another spectrum clone. So this is a, a Mikor spectrum. I think this is also Ukrainian. I think. Um, so th there is a wide variation of keyboards. Um, so some of them, you know, you've got your touch sensitive one, membranes there. Um, it's just so. I think this one you could probably open it up. Maybe. Yeah, there you go. So, um, yeah, so it's, the, the keyboards I find quite interesting to pull apart. Um, also, the power supplies um, are interesting. So, you can see most of them, uh, like the original Spectrum, had a ULA, you know, permitted logic array, which saved a lot of chips, but obviously that was reverse engineered. So, I found that, that there are I do have one here that uses Soviet ULA, but they never kind of work. You know, <laughs> the ones with all the discrete chips tend to work a lot better. Um, so mostly we've got Soviet chips, uh, which are basically equivalent to a 74 LS something or other, Soviet EPROMs, uh, Soviet RAM. They pretty much rule 64K, 64 kilobits, 64 kilobytes. So, but yeah, so this one is, uh, I don't know. Let's see what you think of the Oh, so again, yeah, we've got we've got DIN on the back, but then we've got these other weird ones, uh, which are Soviet for power and video. So, yeah. Uh, is it color Yeah, yeah, they all have RGB out. So, what's the uh, color It's basically a spectrum. So, spectrum is 16. Yeah, something like 8, eight and intensity. Eight, yeah, correct. Like eight. Yeah. eight and slightly less. Yeah. So, but they come with um, modified ROM, so it's basically the Spectrum ROM, 
again, be a slightly different version of it. So, um, this is a uh, Rasson uh, 9003, so this is something from Belarus. So, one, one interesting thing about these spec is so again, we've got the DIN, use of DIN, but none of them use the Spectrum Edge Connector. So, you can't just pop out a, a DIV MMC onto it. That's, you know, so like this one here, it's, um, I think it's a 2x32 or something like that. But the, the, the Soviets also, because um, they weren't imperialist, they used 2.5 millimeter, not 2.54 millimeter pitch. So, um, which is okay on the smaller chips, but like on a edge connector like that, it just won't fit. But uh, like the 40 pin chips, like the Z80s, they don't really fit either. Um, so this keyboard's okay. Um, here we've got a, this, so this is a um, Z80 clone that was originally called the T34. I don't know if it's actually T34. Yeah, yeah, so that's, that's an early Z80 clone. Um, so, but this one uses a, a Soviet ULA, which you can see is that square thing in the middle. Around here. So that square thing, so this one basically doesn't work. <laughs> uh, but it's got a beautiful, and, and the way they, because they don't have any kind of protection on the, on the traces, the way they mount the um, capacitors, I call it space invaders, because they kind of upside down, you can have, you can have a look at it. Um, I thought, it like, you know, you remember the old space invaders, I call it space invaders. So, um, yeah, so this is, this is a Belarus, so, which was part of the Soviet Union. Um, Around. Hmm. Um, almost done. Oh, so uh, back at the next, next to the mark, there is um, a Moldovan white. So, this is also a Moldovan white. But the difference is that one uses discrete logic, whereas this has got one of those ULAs. And it doesn't work. So, it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's got, pretty sure this one's got a ULA. Oh, maybe. Okay, so most of these, so of course I grabbed the one that doesn't have the ULA, but so this one's actually from Moldova. So Moldova's next to Romania. So it was part of the Soviet Union. Um, but this has actually got an East German, it's got an East German Z80, and um, everything else is Soviet. But um, yeah, if you just feel the keyboard like different. Yeah, yeah. Try that one. Almost done. Almost done. Um, this this is a beauty. So this is also uh, from Belarus. This is a Belarusian um, Spectrum. So it's quite a good keyboard. It's a bit mushy. Um, really nice. Yeah, really nice way it's laid out. So, but again, we've got these weird, yeah, everything thin, but then we've got this weird, it, it's a 96 pin connector, three by 32. So, just none of them use the spectrum niche. So I'll actually try to make it convert, it's not working yet. But, um, yeah. So, and, and the interesting thing on this one is that you've got like a two player keypad. So you've got, I've, I've tried to figure out for a while and then I realized, oh, Actually, I think it is two player, but it's it's weird. Yeah, it's so um, I got in a lot of trouble because I accidentally said that this was Bulgarian or something, but it's actually Slovakian, and oh, I got written the comments for it. So it was nicely designed, though. Yeah, so this is a didactic, so um, so this is a Spectrum, they, they actually made, I think they did an Apple compatible one as well, but um, yeah, so this is, um, yeah, so this is from, what's well, from Czechoslovakia, but it's actually, um, yeah, Slovakian. So here we've got an edge connector, which of course is a Spectrum compatible, and we've actually got edge connectors for the joystick for some reason, so that's a didactic. 
Yeah. 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 Because uh, my understanding is that they didn't want Western like material to be easily played, so they use secan. I think the French use as well, but it was slightly different secan to what the French use. So that way you couldn't directly. Yeah. Um, so this is just a keyboard, but it's like a specky keyboard. It's quite a nice one. So I think it uses ball effect uh, key switches. So there was that one. Thank you, Frank. <laughs> and last one, um, this is actually an Oric um, clone, so this is a Bulgarian, so this is a, a Provex 8D, um, so it's actually an Oric, so with, uh, with Cyril, so yeah, I don't know, I think this one, no, I think it's closed up, but, um, it actually has got yeah, modem, modem port, printer port, so yeah. So yeah, if you want to... Sorry, these guys are having too much fun. Are they expecting to export these? No, no, it's like basically for domestic. So they just basically clone the spectrum, clone the spectrum wrong. And they might have customised a little bit, um, but... What's that? I hope we're not falling down. No, 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 that's what that's, it's show and tell, so you can feel it all. So you just see the yeah, massive yeah. difference in the keyboard quality, you know, some of them are, yeah. So, yeah, there we go. Um, so, yeah, so sorry, I didn't really, I really, I wanted to present something a bit better, so maybe I can do that in the future. Um, you yeah, know, showing photos, close up photos and stuff, but um, like on my, web, on my website, on my um, channel, I do kind of zoom in and pull stuff apart, so probably my newer videos are real better than my older ones, but not really. Yeah, so that's just a small smattering of, of posters, probably more post-Soviet, um, like the Privets, the Oric clone, that was um, during Soviet times, but um, most of it came out after the Soviet Union dissolved because People needed computers, you know, they wanted to learn computers. Yeah, so like the, um, basically the guys, like like a lot of Russians and stuff, because, you know, they, they kept developing the spectrum platform. So you've got things like the Harlequin and the Leningrad and stuff like that. So they actually kind of kept pushing the spectrum. So a lot of spectrum games we get today are actually from Russia. So they still are helping them, you know, Russia and places like that. So, yeah. There we go. Um, I've yeah. heard yeah. well, well, that two of them. The space keys on the bottom of the side. It's awkward. Well, you should actually. Well, that's on the spectrum, but um, the Slovakian computers have got tiny little space bars. So I've got, yeah, I've got one at the moment. It's just hard to get used to when you use for conventional people, and you go and you're just like, that's just yeah. case. <laughs> well, the other way around, if you grew up on one of those, then you probably say, like, why do you have such a big space bar? Yeah, it'd be so <laughs> <fun>. <laughs> What a waste, you know, you could fit another 10 keys in here and put a space bar in. Yeah. Okay, so that was, yeah, hopefully that was of some interest, you know. Was that something, something different? Um, that's all right. Unfortunately, um, the contact in, in Canberra can't make it right now. So I'll just do a little talk about what he was going to uh, discuss today. Um, so if we go back to 1982, yeah. so actually even before the Amstrad was around, we've got the ZX80 is coming out, and that has then got a users association, Australian ZX users association, AZUA, and they've uh, published their own little magazine. So the way this was done is that these guys could pan right at them on paper and then photocopy it and then they would mail out the photocopies to people. So you can see we've got the original 
uh, manuscripts that was all that was given to us. So the spectrum that's up the back there is the original spectrum that was used by this guy, his name is David Greenwell. And uh, I just think these are some really great sort of historical documents. You can see, uh, my favourite one is, is this one. So this was, I think, issue five. Yeah. And I don't know if you guys know how the spectrum printer worked, but it, it, had, a, it had a printer of sorts which was, um, if you've ever seen those thermal printers with a big roll of paper that can receipts, it's like that. It had special silver thermal paper. And it was only about this wide. And what this guy's done is he's actually printed out, like he's done basic listings and things to, to generate graphics, printed it on his little thermal printer, and then he's gone and stuck glue two strips of this thermal paper side by side, He's then cut out with scissors a spectrum from a catalog and glued it on the top, you know, so that then when he photocopies it, it all becomes one page. And so he's got really his, difficult publishing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> wonderful. Oh, he's got these little comics and things that he's drawn, all of this stuff. Uh, so we're going to keep the originals in their folders here, but we do have photocopied ones here. Mm -hmm. We'll put out where everyone's mm. reading and sort of look through. Yeah, some of them may do better um, if they're on the keycaps. Happy to pass out a couple of people to look at and pass passing things around. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you might remember the name uh, Roland Perry was mentioned, and he was, uh, as I said, the lead uh, sort of in the technical team designing the CPC. Um, you might also have seen there were a lot of games for the CPC which had the name Roland in them, you know, Roland and Pine, Roland and Caves, Roland and Ropes. Um, so this was actually the role um, because he was running the team at, at the same time. So it was, uh, again, Lord Shuey's idea that when the computer came out, it had to have some software, you know, with no point bringing And so he commissioned some programmers to make games for this uh, system, which was not there. Yeah. They were putting out mm -hmm. a system nice. mm -hmm. in development. And um, just as a bit of a joke, you know, they had a lot of games just with the little guys running around and they decided that whatever the, the game was, they were just going to call the little guy Roland. And so this is Roland and, you know, like I said to him, you know, the whole film was like, it was like meeting Mario <laughs> for real life, you know, so, um, yeah, I'll, I'll start the video. Roland was a man, just an ordinary man. With computers on his mind and time on his hands. Until one day the Lord picked up the phone and called and said, Roland, can you help me invent the CPC? Oh, Roland, oh, Roland, you've stolen our hearts. How did you make the best computer? from the cheapest parts. Oh, Roland, oh, Roland, share your knowledge with us Why? as we recall the history of Amstrad computers. Hi, everyone, and here we have uh, Mr. Roland Perry, who's uh, quite the celebrity in these parts today, being the... Uh, so I understand you were the... Was it the designer, the technical designer, I think, was the... Exact term for the CPC? Well, I like to call myself project manager or project leader or okay. coordinator. So one person, even even 40 years ago, no one person could design a computer anymore. So yeah. I just have lots of talented people working for me. Okay. And would you say you were in, like, the hardware side, the software side, managing? Well, no, the, uh, no the, 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 the magic thing was I was in everything. Yeah. Okay. In my former lives, I'd done hardware, software, sales, marketing, promotions. You know, so I actually did everything. So I could actually join up all those bits and pieces, which is, I think, was quite important. So I think the story that was kind of that, that I've heard is, is that you were sort of presented just with with the box, like with the physical kind of design of the system already, and then, but it was it was up to you and your team to then make something to go inside it. Is that kind of how it worked there? Yeah, I mean, Amstrad's core skill uh, 
was marketing, sales and marketing, but also in production engineering. So um, they did things kind of the opposite way around to most people at the time in the computer industry. So the first thing they did was they thought of a concept. They then designed the case, which had obviously the keyboard on the left and the cassette recorder on the right yeah. and the separate monitor. And all it needed was a circuit board inside it. Mm. So what they did was they found a couple of bright young lads who claimed they could do the circuit board, but it turns out they couldn't. So one of the roles of the company I was working for at the time was what we used to call Project Rescue, where we'd come along and finish off half-completed projects for people, or sometimes they were 90% completed. But in this case, in terms of the circuit board, it was about 0% completed, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah. So what we had to do, so the brief I was given was to, to get together a, a gang of people to make the circuit board that goes inside. Mm. And then, of course, that isn't where it stops because, as well, you need, um, you need a welcome tape, you need a manual, you need um, promotional material, you need a user club, you need extra peripherals, you need 50 games to launch uh, along with the computer to make it a commercial success on the day one. So we ended up kind of up to our elbows in almost everything except actually designing this circuit board. <laughs> I remember that there were all these Roland games yeah, yeah. That were from, from Amsoft, yeah. So were you involved with those? Or, I mean, as, as far as I, I know from being a kid at the time, like, you know, I, I didn't even know there was a real Roland at all, but, you know, so it's it's great to meet you. It's like meeting Mario, isn't it, you know? But, um, I mean, w was that actually, like, named in honour of you? Was that what, what was happening there? Well, it was, a, it was a kind of an in-joke, really, because yeah. the, the first two games we had um, that were any good were Roland on the Ropes and Roland in the Caves, and they were both from a Spanish company who ported them across probably from the Commodore 64. Right. And they both had this little kind of creature jumping up and down, and it was um, uh, Lord Sugar's idea. He said, well, maybe we need to make, you know, we've got two games, the little person jumping up and down, maybe we need some more of these, and who's the person around here who jumps up and down the most? Well, that's <laughs> Roland. <laughs> we'll, call <them. laughs> we'll call it Roland. So that started the series, and I think there's about a dozen of them eventually. I had very little to do with developing the games mm. apart from um, Roland in Time and then Roland in Space, mm. where the developer used to come into my office and sit in the corner, and we lent him some equipment and gave him a few hints about the gameplay, but that was kind of a bit later on. Yeah. Well, I... I mean, and people are still actually making Roland games. I don't know if you've seen this, but even there was one that I saw recently called called Doctor Roland, which was essentially like like Doctor Mario, one of those match the color kind of puzzle games. Um, and the, the character, really well, I've seen, you know, yeah, yeah, the only one I've seen recently is is, is uh, the the Spaniards did a Roland game for me because I went over to one of their yeah. their um, retro events last year. Um, they but yeah, still... I must I must concentrate harder and try and get a collection of all of them. Yeah, no, the, I mean it, it would be very interesting, I think, for you to do that, you know. And you could, it it must be quite an odd thing, you know, to have that. But um, and and yeah, you mentioned Spain because it seems like that there is still a really big scene in Spain and France around the the Amstrad. If you were you were obviously based in in the UK, and it seems like there were a lot of computers kind of coming out of. Uh, written at the time like do you think that that was something just to do with maybe like like having a shared language with america and then a lot of the cpus and things were coming out of america or was there something particular about england at that time you know was it the universities or something or a, do you feel like it was yeah, I, think there was I think there was there was definitely a um home computer um, clique, if you like, of designers in the UK. There's very few developed in other parts of Europe. Mm. You had the Americans with the Apple and the Commodore. Um, but there was also this thing which has now become much more famous, which is this Cambridge phenomenon, which is lots of people in Cambridge and spin-offs mm. who basically um, design computers to try and get in the mould of the BBC Micro, which is the first really successful a British computer after the uh, Sinclair. Yeah. So 
I think I think there was definitely a critical mass of designers and a lot of these other computers. And at one time, and one of the biggest challenges we had when we launched the CPC was there were about 50 other computers all launching at the same time. Yeah. But their problem was that their computers didn't work, whereas ours did. So that helped a lot. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and did you feel like there was something special about what you were doing? Because like you said, there were so many. And, the, you know, you, you had been given this, I guess, as a job by a company that I guess you, you could be forgiven for thinking Amstrad was making something a bit disposable at the time that they said, well, you know, we've got all of this stuff. We've got a tape recorder. Let's stick it in the thing and chuck it out for Christmas. But that you managed to make you know, what, one of the, the ones that was really enduring, like... Well, I think, um, I mean, in terms of our, our company with its Project Rescue hat on, mm. we would do jobs for anybody. You know, we were neut commercially neutral. Yeah. We didn't make a value judgment about the product that people came to us with. A lot of them were hi-fi products mm. or uh, uh, radio products and things like that. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, well, the, the first job we did for Amstrad, which was a few years previously, had been a CB radio, for example. So we were fairly neutral about the uh, organisations we, we did work for. And in fact, at the same time as we were doing the work for Amstrad, there were, there were at least two other companies in Cambridge who were trying to get keyboard computers going and we're giving them a small amount of help, not you know, not taking the project over completely, yeah. but we're trying to get them, you know, help help them on their way. And that's because the company I was working for actually sold all the components that go inside. So if you're going to make like five thousand computers, you need to buy five thousand processor chips and yeah. however many random chips and things like that. And our business was selling those chips in those relatively small quantities. So. And also, say, so Sinclair, who's a bit of a phenomenon anyway, mm. he'd been, he started off like Amstrad did in this sector in audio, sold off in radio, then in audio, and then he moves across to computers. Mm. Now, the reason why Spain's important is because um, we had a distributor in Spain who thought that the computer had a good future for it, and so he came and pitched to us and said, well, can we be one of your major overseas distributors? And we said, well, great, you know, the more distributors we've got, the better. Well, and eventually we ended up with uh, Spain, France and Germany as the three main distributors in, in, in Europe. And he came over with these two games, the Roland in the Caves and the Roland in the Ropes, and said, look, you know, we're clever people. We've written these two games. Can you effectively give us the exclusive contract to distribute these in Spain and so we said well okay then um, give us an order and we'll ship them and you can sell them in Spain now the, the, the problem in Spain was that it was a relatively poor country mm. all right and there was no in there was no native computer industry so if you wanted to buy a home computer in Spain you had to import it yeah. So you either had to buy a Spectrum or a BBC Micro or a Commodore 64 or later on an Amstrad. Yeah. And the issues with all our competitors, the Commodore 64 was too expensive. The BBC Micro was vastly too expensive. The Sinclair Spectrum, they didn't bother to translate it into Spanish or even make more than 80% of them they shipped work when they arrived, which always used to disappoint the retailers. So when ours arrived, they just lapped it up, even though that computer at the time, if you bought one for your, so it was kind of like upper middle class professionals, like school teachers who were buying these computers for their children as a Christmas present, it cost them a whole month's salary just to buy an Amstrad CPC tape computer. But that was the only one they could afford to buy, but they wanted to buy one. So they made that sacrifice and they saved their money and they bought that computer. As a result, there's this massive installed base of CPCs in Spain, mm. which children who were about 10, 12, 13 years old 40 years ago are now getting out of their attics and getting all excited about because this is part of this kind of retro thing. Oh, yeah. We've had retro vinyl records, we've had retro this and retro that and the last couple of years, it all been retro home computers. But nobody's got a Commodore 64 in their attic because nobody ever bought one in Spain. 
Yeah, like, like when you look at the, the cost of computers back then, but, but I guess, yeah, people really wanted them. And I suppose the, the other thing, though, is that, that I think, well, you know, if, if my dad had known I was going to keep using the computer for like nearly 40 years, you know, I guess that makes it worthwhile, doesn't it? You know, if yeah. you amortize it over that period, it's not really expensive. Well, going back to one of your earlier questions, so we were commissioned to um, design the circuit board to go inside, and I got together a group of largely old friends of mine who had been working on computers, APIC, more kind of um, uh, small business home, uh, computers rather than home computers. So we got together. We had various skill sets that we'd built up as a result of uh, uh, the, that previous work. And our, our thought was, well, Amstrad wants to build a computer to a particular price because, and it's still true today, if you stick something in the shops at one ninety nine, more people are going to buy it than if you stick it in the shops at two twenty five. Oh, yes. There's this big psychological thing. Mm. So you've got to build it for a price so you can sell it in the shops for one ninety nine or whatever. So we understood that they had a price that they needed to build it to. We also knew that the cost of a... PC like that or home PC like that is basically the cost of the chips and the cost of the motherboard and the cost of the hardware. If you wire the chips up more cleverly or you write the software more cleverly, it doesn't cost a penny more to build it. You just get a better computer for the same build cost. Yeah. And we all had, we'd all had a background also. We knew about Condor 64s. One of the things I did previously was... Uh, I was an uh, editor for a computer makers. Well, it's a basically electronics magazine in the UK, and I had a column where I reviewed things like home computers. So I'd actually done quite extensive reviews of other home computers before. And so what we did is we sat down and we said, well, what can we learn from the Commodore 64, the Spectrum, and BBC Micro, and do it differently and do it better? Not because they did it wrong, all right, but because it's now three years later and we've got some experience and some hindsight that if we were starting building one today, we would actually do it slightly differently. And so we took all that accumulated knowledge and put it together, and that's where you get the CPC 464. Or, for example, it's got this when you plug an expansion box on the back, like the disk drive or serial interface, it's got a ROM in it. And that ROM then clamps itself into the ROM on the motherboard, and it just works seamlessly. Well, that's what Acorn called sideways ROMs. Right. So we just stole that idea off them because it's a good idea, mm. you know? So we just stole all the best ideas off all <laughs> the other people. <laughs> Later on, some of them got cross with us and said, well, why did you steal our best ideas? And we said, well, why shouldn't we? <laughs> I think sometimes that's the thing, you know, often with a new industry that, you know, before the lawyers get involved, that yeah. there's, there's so much exchange of ideas, you know, because it's all the really, you know, the enthusiasts who are doing it. Well, I think, I think you know, if we'd, as a company, Amstrad didn't go in for filing patents and things like that. Mm. Um, it was just in too much of a hurry and that involved lawyers and they didn't like lawyers and stuff like that. But I think I think there's probably dozens of things that we put in the, the 464 and the laser machines, which we could have patented and made a fortune just on the royalties later on. Mm. But we weren't in that kind of business. Um, but I used to talk to people um, all the time who worked for Acorn, who worked for Sinclair designing the QL. So we were, we were all this kind of little backroom club of people working for comp competing companies. Yeah. It didn't bother me. Because I knew there was no there was no prospect that Acorn or Sinclair or anybody else could produce a computer like the CPC four six four in three or six months to compete with the one that we were already halfway through producing. So it wasn't a commercial threat. So if I could if I could get ideas off them go and talk to them and say, well, what would you have put in this computer if you'd been given free reign and a chance and a bit bigger budget? 
And they said, well, we probably have done this or we probably have done that. And so that I then went back to my team and said, well, do we have the budget? Do we have the time to put an idea like that into this computer? And a lot of the time they said, yeah, of course we can. You know, you just have to ask. Yeah, and I guess even, yeah, there's so many little touches. Like um, if you, you know, if, if you have nothing on the screen and then you press delete and it beeps. The, yeah. That's actually really useful because, um, so this is my, you know, resurrected eBay CPC here. Um, and I got it without a monitor, so I've just put this little okay. screen. So it's actually sitting on top of kind of a, a tower of um, adapters and power supplies. Oh, right. But, yeah, so try to troubleshoot it. You know, if you do something and the screen isn't working, that you can just go, and you, oh, okay, I know that it's booted. <laughs> you know, so... Yeah, there's there's always these little things, I guess, that kind of pop up, you know. That well, one of the other ones was we had a, um, the the screen editor for the basic. You mm. could just move the cursor left, right, up and down, because that seemed like the sensible thing to do. Why yeah. nobody else did that? I've no idea. I mean, it's only sort of half a day's programming to put something like that in there. Yeah, that, yeah. Look, and again, go, go, going back to the screen. Um, what we wanted to do, what we you know, were tasked with doing, was making 50 pre-production prototypes, giving them to software houses and saying, right, here you go, and here's a, here's a technical manual about three inches thick, which nobody before has ever given you. This is how it works. Can you either write some new games or convert your Spectrum or your Commodore 64 games onto our platform so that we can have it in the shops when the, when the product launches. And I thought, well, it's going to be a lot of hard work to make 50 monitors to go with these 50 keyboards, so what should we do? And I said, well, I think probably most of these software houses have got an Ac uh, BBC, Acorn BBC Micro Monitor mm. hanging around somewhere, so I'll just make the connector on the back compatible with the Acorn connector. That's so you just plug one of those in. Yeah. It's just, you know, just such a simple idea. Why make it different just for the sake of it? Oh, yeah. And um, I've been spending a lot of time lately because we've, we've got a few Amstrads around the, the museum, but not a lot of monitors. That's the thing is the monitors are probably the weakest link because, you know, they've got CRTs and big capacitors. Yeah. But the computers themselves, they, they still work after all this time. And, yeah, so it, it's... Yeah, well, one of the reasons why the computers still work it's because they were made by a Japanese company that had a factory in South Korea. All right. And the Japanese are extremely good at producing product that works. Mm. They, you know, it, it's, it's, the, their whole culture is we cannot be found out shipping you a computer that doesn't work. You know, that'd be such a great shame on our company if we ever shipped you one that didn't work. Yeah. All right. Whereas some of the other companies, and I'll mention no names, um, would outsource their production to other companies who said, well, if 80% of them work, well, that's good enough, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Something that I have sort of wondered about is that the, the colour system is pretty much unique I think I, I think there was like one other machine that um, has been mentioned that I don't know that nobody except um, really hardcore collectors seems to have, have them but uh, there was something called the Enterprise which apparently had the 27 colours but it's that sort of like a, a, a trinary system I guess you could call it where yeah exactly yeah, I know exactly three, what you're talking about that. for each yeah. Yeah. the Enterprise was one of the machines which was um what we call vaporware. They, they pretty much never produced any, but everyone was kind of waiting for them to produce it and yeah, saying, well, I won't buy one of your computers because next week I'm going to buy an enterprise. But they, you know, they just kind of hardly ever turned up. Yeah, so what we had was we were originally briefed to, to have 16 colours because every other computer had 16 colours. Yeah. Okay. Well, computers like that don't have 16 colours. They have eight colours, and eight colours in bright. So it's it's still only really eight colours. Yeah. You know, right? And but when I was talk, we're talking to one of our hardware designers, um, a guy called Roger Hurry, who's a very clever member of my team, and 
So we're saying to him, well, we'd like to try and have more than 16 colours just as a kind of a, a selling point. And he said, well, that's really easy. All you've got to do, instead of having every um, pin on the monitor either being on or off, we could make it halfway. Yeah. And, and buy that. And all you've got to do is buy six resistors, that's, which are about kind of one cent each. Mm. So if you, if, you, if you don't connect the video output to the five volts, you don't connect it to the zero volts, it then floats to two and a half volts. Right. And suddenly you've got 27 colours. Yeah. But, but it, it's, it's so amazing. Just, because... a, just such a, br a brilliant thing, you know, and, yeah. it, and it costs almost nothing. And, and like you said, I mean, you, you couldn't have orange on a spectrum. You know, you can have mm -hmm. like red or yellow or light red or light, but you can't have orange. You know, yeah. and so yeah, like that's I think a great thing about the the CBC is that you do have those really vibrant colours that you can have, like an orange that's really, you know, saturated, and then you can sort of have like a light, like a pastel or a dark or a saturated version of all the primary yeah. colours. So yeah, there were just some real, and then I guess uh, going further into that, so. Uh, say that like, like the spectrum, you know, had that very infamous like the attribute thing where they talk about where everything was in kind of these tiles. I guess the screen was divided up into you know, and, and each block could only have really one color in it. So it was almost like a black and white picture with then like a, a another very low mm -hmm. res. And I think the the Commodore used something a bit similar where there were like areas where you could only have so many colors in each area. But the, the Amstrad is completely bitmap so that you can have like any of the 16 colors next to each other at any point well, yeah well, yeah well, that's right i mean some people have criticized it mm. and called it a, a crudely designed computer because all it had was a bitmap but at the end of the day it gives you better results well it's great for pixel art yeah like you can do some really beautiful you know pixel art stuff and i guess yeah that, that's the thing is that for something like design software you know or, or art software where you don't need it to be moving things around really fast, then it's really good because you can just have whatever you can think of you can put on the screen. One of the things, when you, particularly when you're designing a Z80 computer, um, one of the trade-offs that you have to have is the amount of time that the processor spends talking to the um, video memory, the amount of time the processor spends talking to the program that you've written for it, so these are the kind of you know, um, tricks of the trade in, in actually designing the hardware uh, to get the best compromise between those two. It, is it the sort of thing where the it, it's not like, I, I know they say in the old Ataris that the CPU would have to actually be drawing the screen and then kind of when it got to the end, you know, it would have that, that little interval of blank where it would actually do the processing mm -hmm. and then it would have to go and, but in the CPC, it, it, it sort of has its own video. Thing. Yeah, the, yeah, it's not... the, yeah the, CP, the CPC is kind of um, reading out the memory to the screen, if you like, yeah. in, at the same time as actually thinking about what it needs to be putting on screen next. Yeah, because I, I think, I mean, I think it was the, the ZX80 was the, the first Sinclair one, and, and the... You, you couldn't animate anything because it would have to draw the whole screen and then you could only do, do your computation in between the screen, you know, so each frame yeah. it would have to kind of think about it and then redraw it or something. Mm -hmm. Were you involved in the PCW? Was that something? Oh, that yes, I mean, very much so. I mean, we started designing the PCW about when the uh, CPC was launched because that was going to be the next year's product. And it takes about a year to develop a product like that. And so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And But they ended up sort of side by side, really, that, you know, the PCW didn't replace the CPC, that they were very different things. So yeah, well, the original idea with the PCW was that it was going to be just a word processor. Mm. Everyone kept complaining and saying, well, it's got a computer in it. Why can't we run CPM and business programs on it? And we said, yeah. because it's a dedicated word processor, you know, your, your, your vacuum cleaner's got a processor in it, but you don't expect to play video games on it. But 
you know, they didn't buy that. And so we eventually had to relent and ship it with CPM so you could run other things. And actually people wrote games for it as well. The original idea was it was a closed system. So the exact opposite of the CPC, which is a really open system. Yeah. This didn't just to be an appliance that you wrote letters with. Yes. And actually, it was, it was probably more successful commercially than the CPC was. It was more expensive and we sold more of them, so we made more money at it. Right. Yeah, we, we do have PCW in the museum. Um, we haven't quite got it working yet, though. We've managed to turn it on, but I think it needs a boot disk or something before it can... Yeah, it also, yeah there's, all, all the ROM in it does is boot off the disk, so you yeah, need so to boot it. I'm, I'm going to have to try and create a boot disk, I think, because I do have some, some mm. blank floppies in that, that odd size. So, yeah, I'm sure you can download the, the the disk image off the internet somewhere. Yeah, everything's um everything's archived somewhere. So you know we'll we'll keep looking around. Hopefully by the time of the uh, that we're showing this video, ACW is up and running, and you know everyone's played head over heels on it or something like that. So yeah, um, were you involved with the plus range and uh, the console? Not was, really. Uh, yeah. Wait, no, not really, because by then I'd moved on to PCW and then the PC clones. And so other members of my team took over managing the okay. um, future versions. Do you know anything about um, Amstrad? So you were talking about the PC uh, machines. Do you know anything about the, the Mega PC where there was a Sega console built into it? Well, again, um, that was much later on. Yeah. And that was an idea that people had. They said, well, let, we're, we're selling PCs quite successfully. Um, what if we kind of did a combo PC mega thing in the bob Yeah. And so they, they they managed to drum up some people internally to engineer that. But I, I was off doing other stuff by then. It's, and it's a funny thing because I feel like so much effort must have gone into making it. And... It's sort of in a way, maybe it didn't really need to exist, though. That Was it there's really something of, that people wanted? But There's lots of products. That's not the only one. Yeah. But if people people claim they'd buy it if you made it, mm -hmm. eventually got to give in and say, well, enough people are saying they'll buy one if we make it. Then why don't we make it? And then they turn around and say, oh, I was just kidding. I was actually going to buy one. Well, I think that that probably comes into that category. Yeah, it's it's something that I mean, it looks really cool. Like when you you know, and and just the concept of it seems really cool. But again, it's it's like that. Then if you had to actually sort of spend the money on it, you know, that you think, well, you can kind of already buy those bits separately. But n nowadays, though, like if if you have one, you know, that they they're real collectors items because it, it is so unique. I guess that Seeker would have had to be involved too, like. Yeah I'm, sure, yeah, I'm sure they were, yeah. Because at one time we were uh, almost involved with Nintendo as well. Okay. I'm wondering about whether we should do, you know, presumably do a similar thing with Nintendo rather than Sega. Did you ever think, like, that you were making things that were going to one day be, you know, be in a museum and that would be kind of put on, put on a pedestal and people would talk about them? Well, I, I, I remember taking my team to a Sinclair show in London about halfway through the... Because they had big... Um, they had hired a big hall and everyone would turn up and sell their peripherals and software and things like that. And I said, well, one day we'll have a show like this. And they all said, oh, are you joking? You know, it's never, it's never going to be that successful. And actually, if we'd thought at the time that the product we were designing would be sold by the million rather than by the 100,000, it would actually have put us off because we would have said, well, this is a bit of a risk, really. Mm. You know, if we if we mess this up, it's going to be a disaster. So it was actually quite comforting for us to think that it was, at least initially, envisaged as a, as a, really, as a fairly small-scale product. I mean, the original aim was to sell 100,000 in a year. Yeah, we ended up selling two hundred thousand in a year, and then several million over about four or five years. And I say if we'd if we'd come in at the beginning and and they'd said to us, "Well, we want you to design a computer that's going to sell four million things," we'd have said, "Nope, <laughs> this is just too scary." <laughs> yeah, and I guess you, you might 
want to play it safe a lot more, and that then some of you know some some of the ideas that then turn out to be well, we'd, well, we'd, we'd, have, we'd have asked for a bigger fee as well. <laughs> I think we're going to have to wrap it up, but I, I just okay. want to say, yeah, thank you so much for, for being here today. And, uh, yeah, like, like I said, you know, the, the CPC was a big part of my childhood. It was something that, you know, and now I work in computers and I think that having that computer at home is what was sort of able to, you know, kind of teach me the skills that I use now. And, and, it's kind of funny that you think, you know, all the time that I spent dodging my homework so that I could go and write basic programs or something. But, you know, did I really need to know, like, what, what the capital of um, Peru is or something? <laughs> you know? No. Well, like, uh, well, actually, a lot of people say that to me. Yeah. They say they haven't had one of those computers. Mm. Yeah, it really set them up and, and gave them an idea about what, what career they could have. Yeah. Anyway, if you want to do another one of these in maybe three or six months' time, feel free to get in touch. Anyway, we're right at the end now. It's been great chatting, Chen. Goodbye. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, then. Thanks. Bye. Well done. Last time. Okay, guys. Yeah, so we'll, we'll break for lunch now. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll shut down some of these machines, I guess, just so that they're better going out. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we're, we're just going to go to the portos down the road there. And then we'll come back and get everything up and running again and we can all, you know, go around and have a